So it's Saturday the 9th, um, Saturday afternoon, and I'm down in the church garden. You know those films that sometimes your wife makes you watch and you think you'll go along with it? I think it's in Pride and Prejudice where uh, one of the lesser of the sisters gets married to uh, a clergyman. Maybe he's not what sort of person, but uh, I think the idea is that when she gets bored with him, she tells him to go and tour. Go a walk, a tour around the garden, and whether you make that direct, direct connection or not, uh, I'm doing a tour in the garden because it's been a long week uh, and a cold week. So I come down to the church garden today, and as much to, to take a walk around here and see what it looks like during winter. And uh, as you can see behind me, the boilers are going simply to put a wee bit of heat in the, the building and stop the frost getting at it. It was 7 degrees according to the boilers. So I'm giving it a quick tour around uh, at the same time as I'm down here to record a message. I thought I'll take a look around here and see what it looks like in what is a cold and hard start for all of us, not just uh, physically but metaphorically as we're closed for uh, at least until the, the start the second Sunday in February. And I'll do a short message now uh, which will relate to what it's like to start a new year and maybe a hope and a promise within that. I planted the beans, uh, or rather the, the kids and the kids still planted the beans in the first week of October. As much as they've grown well, you can see that they're suffering here, uh, and all lying flat apart from three. I'm reliably told that beans do recover and they are resilient to frost, but this is going to be a test for them. Um, the leeks are going okay, they're steady, and uh, the, uh, the onions, they're, they're looking a bit sad and tired as well. As it was part of this, as a metaphor for how life is, I can see that even, even now, in the honeysuckle, it's resilient and even defiant to the cold weather outside that there are flowers on it. And... I wanted to go with that thought and suggest that even now, as things are looking tired and frostbitten, this garden will recover, and so too, Life Times Church St Columbus will also recover. It's a cold time now, it's a hard time, but we will get back. I'll go in now and we'll take a, a Bible reading from the prophecy of Jeremiah, and see see what relevance that has for the rest of us.
In the passage of Scripture in Jeremiah, chapter 31, through to 32, there's some of Jeremiah's best promises. that I, He will put a covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, he says in verse 33 of chapter 31, I will write their laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man teach his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the greatest to the least. I will forgive them their wickedness and remember their deeds no more. He who appoints the sun to shine by day and decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stars up, stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel cease to be a nation before me. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth be searched out, will he reject all the, day, all the descendants of Israel because of what they have done. The days of coming, when this city will be rebuilt, the measuring line will stretch from here to the hill of Gareb and turn to Goa. This is a city that will never again be uprooted or demolished. Those are bold claims. And <coughs> they're they're not necessarily anchored in any particular place or time until the following chapter when Jeremiah and the king have a dispute and the king rebukes him saying why do you prophesy as you do saying this is what the Lord says I'm about to do to hand the city over to the king of Babylon and he will capture it Paul, <clears throat> in this passage Jeremiah is criticised not just from people who don't want to hear his message but from the king himself Jeremiah was very plain that because of ongoing and perpetual generational sins that this kingdom will fall, and so it did. But there's something about Jeremiah that gets very down-to-earth and practical. And when I say down-to-earth, I literally mean do uh, mud, dirt and earth. The passage continues in Jeremiah 32. He says, The word of the Lord came to me. Your uncle is going to come to you and say, Buy my field in Anathoth, because as your nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Anathoth wasn't that far off from Jerusalem. It was the home country of Jeremiah. Already it had been captured. Already it was under enemy hands and he couldn't reach it. And yet, the passage continues. Just then, my cousin Hamael came to me in the courtyard and said, Buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it's your right to redeem it, possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field in Anathoth from my cousin, weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver, signed and sealed the deed, and had it witnessed and weighed out the silver and the scales. I took the deed of purchase the sealed copy containing them, the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and gave it to my secretary, Baruch the son of Nora, in the presence of my cousin and of the witnesses who had signed the deed and of all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. (laughs) 
why would you buy some buildings, some ground, if it's under enemy control, if you'd no chance to use it, no chance to benefit from it, but for the fact that he wanted to put his money where his mouth is? I don't know how much 17 shekels of silver was worth then, whether it was a good price or a bad price. But if I suggested that you should buy, uh, I don't know, uh, the deeds to a, a hotel in, in downtown Afghanistan, or what about that tidy little apartment that you always wanted, but it happens to be in the middle of Syria? What happens if you wanted to buy somewhere where it's a war-torn place in the back end of Libya? It doesn't seem like a wise investment. But Jeremiah parted with hard cash for a place that he, he otherwise could have walked away from, kept his cash and kept it for contingencies. Instead, he bought it. And it's very clear in the passage that he did everything correctly. He weighed out the silver. He had witnesses. He signed the deeds. He signed both sets of deeds. He had them in a clay jar so that they would be preserved for a long time. The passage continues. He says, take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies, put them in a clay jar so that they will last a long time. And the reason? For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. And after I'd given the deed, I prayed to the Lord. And this prayer is found in Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your great power and outstretched hand. Nothing is too hard for you. You shew loves to thousands and bring punishment on the father's sins of the laps of their children after them. O great and powerful God, whose name is Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of men and you reward everyone according to his conduct and his deeds deserve. You've performed miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt and continue to this day both in Israel and among all mankind. You have gained re that renown that is still yours. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by your mighty hand and outstretched arm and with great power. You give them this land and have sworn to give you, that you had sworn to give to your forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. They came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey your law. They did not do what you commanded them. So you brought all this disaster upon them. See how the seed ramps are built against the city. Because of the sword, famine and plague, the city will be handed over to the Babylonians who are attacking it. What you have said has happened, and now you see. And though the city will be handed over to the Babylonians, you, O Lord, sovereign Lord, say to me, buy the field with silver and have the action, the transaction witnessed. Then the Lord says, Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, this is what the Lord says I'm about to do. The Babylonians who are attacking this city will come in and set it on fire and will burn it down. From the day this city was built until now, this city has so aroused my anger and wrath that I must remove it from my sight. The people have provoked me with all their evil. They have set up idols. They have built high places. You are saying about this city by sword and famine. But I will surely gather them all from all the lands that I banished them in my furious anger. I will bring them back to this place and I will let them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me for their own good and for the good of the children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. I will inspire them to fear me, that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. This is what the Lord says. As I have brought all this calamity on the people, so I will give them prosperity, I promise them. Once more fields will be bought in this land, which you say, it's a desolate waste without men or animals. It's been handed over to the Babylonians. Fields will be bought for silver, and deeds will be signed, sealed, and witnessed in the territory of Benjamin, 
in the villages around Jerusalem, in the towns of Judah and in the towns of the hill country, of the western foothills and of the Negev, because I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. That reading ends at verse, the, the last verse of chapter 32. I suppose what I want to say at this, it's a cold place here just now. Cold in this building, cold outside. 2021 has started colder and more bitter than we imagined. Whilst 2020 was uh, one that started like every other year, it certainly by Easter had turned into a, a, a dark, unwelcoming time, a time where no hugs, no kisses, no close contact, no calls around sitting in with friends. Businesses are closed, businesses may reopen. But we're at that time where all that seems difficult has come upon us, and, and some have taken a harder hit in loss of loved ones and loss of income and loss of jobs. I want to affirm maybe three things in this short message. It says, God is not unaware of all men's ideas, all men's schemes, all men's thoughts. Men make their plans, but God directs their path. I'm not sure I want to get into a whole dilemma of whether God has planned this against us or is it's a natural phenomenon, but either way, we suffer and we pray and we appeal to God's mercy and his restoration. And I take it in this passage that even if Jeremiah didn't see the time where he could take that land and plant something of it, his family, his successors, his generation following him did. It was theirs. They bought it as an act of faith. And so too, we're making plans here that we will see these empty pews filled with people who are happy to come and celebrate to embrace and join in fellowship, worship, song, prayer, laughter, meals together, and continue our testimony to the saving work of Jesus Christ. This is a promise that's given to us. And so this morning, as I'm down here in a cold place preaching to a small screen and empty pews, I want to declare these three things. First of all, that God's not unaware of how we are. He acts with compassion. His passage, the passage here says that it, he, he will deal with sin. The, the errors, the misplaced hopes, the displaced dreams, he knows about the confusion in our hearts. The good things we want to do, the things we're frustrated with, our mistakes and our values, our bad choices. God does judge. God does judge. But in the midst of that, there's always a promise. In all these Old Testament writers, whether it's Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, there's talk of a winnowing, a, a thinning out. And so it may be that we're going to have to build back again from smaller places than we imagined. All our plans and thoughts of, of what we'll do in our, in our church as a body, in our smaller groups, whether it be fellowship groups, children's work, teenage work, others, has been, they've been limited, they've been faulted, and yet they've, they've drawn out more creativity, more imagination, just to keep in touch with one another. Our letters went out at Christmas, small packages to remind everyone connected with this congregation that we remember them and so in some small token so does God Jeremiah and his temple and all the practices that he'd hoped to do in a normal weekday worship and work up and down routine of life was certainly disrupted and so ours to a limited degree has been interrupted and we've, we found ourselves in smaller groups walking around the park on a Sunday morning. And even that's not open to us this, uh, for these next few weeks to meet with fewer people. But we're encouraged to stay at home, to trust and to pray. This is going to be a particular uh, time of, of emphasized personal prayer for ourselves, for those whom we love, for those who are responsible for us, leadership within this nation, but also for those who are working harder 
for the numbers of staff who are uh, in essential occupations that find colleagues don't report for work either because they're ill or because they're self-isolating. And so the brunt of the work falls on fewer people. Let's take the opportunity to affirm them personally by message, by phone call, by others, but, but also to pray that, Lord, you will do what you promise. There's a start to this pandemic, there's a start, there's a cost and a process, but there will be a finish. There will be a finishing time where a thinner, clearer-minded, purer people who will have the heart and mind of God as a new instinct. Let's also look to at that prophetic word that in personal cost and sacrifice, Jeremiah puts himself to the cost of buying something that he doesn't yet enter into the possession or joy of. He puts in a trust and a hope that God will renew. And if that means buying a place that he doesn't see but others will, let's see what way God will call each one of us in different places. Whether it's buying a, a field in his home territory. Anathoth was where he grew up. Benjamin just outside there, outside Jerusalem. It's a place of promise and hope. A place of not yet, but a place uh, of current cost. The cost is now, the benefit is later. I'm hoping for small things. Maybe with my uh, crop of beans and seeing kids club reaping them uh, in the, by Easter or, or, or afterwards. And maybe it'll be a sign to them, maybe, I don't know, it'll last a lifetime or not, that the, the beans they planted in a cold, a cold autumn will be like a festive meal. And, and not only with that, that it, with that small gesture, maybe they'll see too that things are worth planting for, investing for early on. And maybe after we've forgotten that good things are never wasted. This afternoon, <clears throat> when we go back to the house, we'll be planting some seeds for salads, for other, other things to see if they'll grow in a window box and then later out into the, the garden. Maybe so too, you'll still be planting other things. The kind words with family members, the phone calls, the, the, the chats, the occasional meet-up, however that's going to be, um, found within the limits that are imposed upon us. Jeremiah wasn't reckless either. He didn't run out to the opposing forces surrounding the city and, and have some heroic, defiant and short-lived rally against them. He was patient. He took, he took his time, God's time, to see God's will worked out. And so we cannot, I think, prematurely jump to a conclusion or jump to, uh, into a denial or into uh, some heroic folly that we don't need masks and COVID's a false thing or, or this or that. I've seen enough suffering even in these past number of months or our families bereaved to know it's real. So we'll take prudent steps to keep ourselves safe. Washing hands, meeting people, going out to the shop when you have to, not taking unnecessary risks. But at the same time, with the fortitude that as we stay strong in the, the hours, days, weeks, during this period, that it'll come good in the end. God has promised that we will see. We will see hope. That in this desolation, in the waste, there will be a time where God will restore what we've lost and bring us hope and a future. May God bless you. Eternal world, and as 
Christ is with us, he's with us. 